Welcome to the third part of the historic walk of Old Galt, Cambridge. In the descriptions below is all the information you need for parking, stores and more. If you're continuing this walk from part two, welcome back. If you're starting here, you can either park at 15 Wellington and walk over, or park at Water Street lot number two that you can access from both Ainsley and Water Street. We're starting off on Water Street looking at the Scott block that was built for the livestock broker John Scott in 1890. It's a Romanist revival style it housed a variety of businesses and the independent order of the Oddfellows Lodge. It's an organization aimed at self-improvement and charity and helping the less fortunate. As for the name, who knows? There's lots of theories but no facts about why they call themselves the Oddfellows. It was very popular throughout the 1800s, but its popularity declined during the Great Depression in the 1920s. The building has a fabulous front door with rounded windows and above it, a terracotta tower on the roof with interesting brick detail on the front of the building. Across the street, number 7 to 11 Water Street, is a building that has a true ghost sign still visible on the side. Allen and Ray, Furniture and Undertakers. A little further on is George's Restaurant. Here since 1951, George's Restaurant has been serving the finest Canadian and Chinese food as seen in this original menu. Now run by the third generation of the Cito family, George's Restaurant is known for its fresh, not frozen, ingredients and its family secret recipes that are all homemade. They also have vegetarian and gluten-free options. The interior has stayed strikingly similar in the last 70 years. Famously loved and popular is number 18 for one, egg roll, sweet and sour chicken, sugai almond, and vegetable fried rice. So popular, they had it made into their license plate. At present, the main entrance off Water Street is closed due to COVID, so use the back wheelchair accessible entrance off Dixon. Back to this side of the street, I want to point out this bow art style building with its imposing columns that was designed by local architect Frederick Mellish, the same one who designed the fire hall on Dixon Street. This was the Galt Library built in 1905 and remained the public library until 1967 when a new one was built on the other side of the river. This building here is actually a Carnegie Library, meaning that it was financed by the Scottish-American, self-made, multi-millionaire Andrew Carnegie, the same fellow that built Carnegie Hall in New York City. Born in 1835 in Scotland, when Carnegie was 12, his family emigrated to America. There he got a job paying him $1.12 a week, working 12 hours a day, 6 days a week, as a bobbin boy, about $58 a year. By age 24, he was the superintendent of the Western Division of the Pennsylvania Railroad Company, with a salary of $15,000 a year. His life was one business success after another, especially after he entered the steel industry. But he was also known as a wealthy man who cut the wages in a steel mill that led to a strike that left 10 workers dead. He became the richest man in the world when he sold his steel company in 1901 at age 67 for a staggering $480 million. $480 million at a time when a loaf of bread would cost 7 cents. When he had been young, he had been given access to a private library and wanted to do the same for other people with public libraries. He started the Carnegie Foundation, where he donated money for the construction of public libraries in the US, Canada and around the world, mostly English-speaking countries. There were over 2,500 public libraries built with the Carnegie money. 125 were in Canada. Cambridge is lucky it doesn't just have one Carnegie library, it has three, because each of the independent towns of Hessler, Preston and Galt applied for and received money from the Carnegie Foundation. Which makes me think that somebody around here was very good at filling out paperwork. All three buildings are still standing, while only the one in Hessler, that's been enclosed in glass, is still being used as a library. On the corner of Dixon and Water is the Galt Post Office, the newer one. The original Galt Post Office is still standing at 12 Water Street. This one was built in 1936 by G. H. Thompson and Son, and it's still a working post office. With its marble interior, it was built to last. On the riverside, we're going to take the walk called the Living Levee, and I want to point out the small stone building that's on the right here. The Lutz House was built between 1849 and 1851, and it's one of the earliest large stone homes in the area. The owner, Morris C. Lutz, built a foundry and farm implement factory in Galt, and became Galt's first mayor when the city became incorporated. A foundry was vital to the success of any small town in Upper Canada, so the crucial farm implements could be made and easily accessible. The Living Levee was developed after the flood of 1974. 
There have been 10 major floods and countless minor ones in the Galt downtown since the 1800s. Time after time, decade after decade, the water of the Grand River would cause havoc. But the flood of 1974 was a doozy and things had to change. What used to stand here before the flood walls were constructed was the Turnbull Woolen Mills. Famous for wool underwear. And I do mean famous. It was the only form-fitting wool underwear in the time in North America. Robert Turnbull established his business in 1859, but it was in 1861 when he brought a new type of knitting machine from Scotland that Turnbull and his then partner Deans became the first and only manufacturers of full fashion knit underwear on the continent. Other knitwear was knitted in tubes and then either sewn or knitted together. It wasn't very comfortable and didn't fit very well. But full fashion underwear could be made to fit the human body. Turnbull employed over 100 people in the 75,000 square foot of floor space where raw wool, that was mostly from Australia, was clean, carded, spun, and knit into the finest underwear you could buy. Most of the Turnbull factory is gone. It was made into the Mill Race Park. A mill race is a channel of water that's diverted from the river to make a swift current of water to power a water well. There's a stunning stone amphitheater where you might be lucky enough to see a wedding there when you visit. Looking down into the race, you can see some of the old equipment that was used to power the woolen mill. The Mill Race Amphitheater is used as a venue for various events in Cambridge, so make sure to check events listed below to see if anything is happening. You will often see boats on the water and people on the side of the river fishing. You can take the steps down to the river where there's a boat launch, perfect for your kayak or canoe, which I'll be showing you in a later episode. Looking up the river, you'll see the Park Hill Bridge that's over the Park Hill Dam, and on the other side of that is the Cambridge Mill Restaurant. Many people think that this was the site of the first mill in Gulf, but they're wrong. That was actually downriver. There was a dam that was built here in 1839 for the numerous mills that were being built on the river. The Grist Mill was built in 1843 and operated by James Ewa. The mill is now known as the Cambridge Mill Restaurant, renowned for its fine dining and spectacular views of the river. You can follow the pathway that will lead to a better look at the CNR overpass built in 1931, famous because it was the first train bridge to be built with all Canadian material, manpower, manufacture. You can continue with the trail that leads to Galt Collegiate Institute. It'll take about 15 minutes to walk there. There's no access to the school from the path. You'll have to walk up to Dayton Street, and walk up the street to the side parking lot of the school campus. From there, you can walk onto the grounds when the school is not in progress. Galt Collegiate Institute has an amazing history that I'm just going to touch on. It began as the Galt Grammar School in 1852 with eight boys, and under the Irish scholar William Tassie in 1853, it grew into one of the finest grammar schools in North America, with boys attending from Canada, the United States, England, and the West Indies. In 1871, the Galt Grammar School was among the first in Ontario to become a collegiate institute. Galt Collegiate Institute. In 1881, Tassie resigned and was succeeded by John Bryant. GCI became a co ed school at the same time. The building itself has been added on to many times since 1853. It was designed in the Scottish baronial style with wonderful architectural elements such as stone towers and a decorative cupola like ventilator hoods. It's been suggested many times that the oldest part of the building is haunted. Tobacco smoke is smelt, and it's thought to be William Tassie making an appearance to keep an eye on the school he made so famous. From the front of the school, you can see the train bridge that passes over Water Street. In 1956, a spectacular wreck happened on the bridge when two freight trains collided as one did not follow procedure and was hit by a second fast-moving train. Sadly, two people died. For days afterwards, the residents of Galt came down to take a look at the two twisted trains. The full story can be read about in Paul Lincoln's book, Tragedy in Galt. You can walk back taking the same path or taking the sidewalk on Water Street and join the path again by the apartment building. Going back to the core, you'll notice a busy area to your left by the road. L.A. Frank's is a great burger joint that's only open during the warm months. Mouth-watering fries, burgers, ice cream and more. They're a Cambridge icon. L.A. Franks is one of the original Turnbull buildings. Hello. Now I'm going to give you a very quick sneak peek at another Cambridge treasure. If you're interested in antiques, across the road from the Living Levee is Southworks Antiques, one of the largest and oldest indoor antique malls in Canada. Open 363 days a year, 
only closed for Christmas and New Year's Days. Their quality vendors have a wide variety of vintage and antique goods. Their 35,000 square foot store also shares a space with the Nostalgia and Company. From candy to remember as a kid to retro appliances and furniture, this store truly is a blast from the past. Walking back to Main Street, you can either return on the path you came in on or go down to the water and walk there. There's a set of stairs by the Carnegie Library that'll take you back up to street level. Crossing the Grand River is the Main Street Bridge. The first Main Street Bridge was built in 1819 by Absalom Shade. Because of the many floods and gulf, there has been numerous bridges, until a steel one was built in 1878. This bridge was built in 1931. It's a multiple span concrete bowstring arch bridge. This type of design was popular in the 20s and 30s, and there are two other bridges of this design in the Waterloo region. It requires minimal material, was simple to install, and most important for the time, it could withstand vehicular traffic. In 2010, the fiber artist Sue Sturdy did an art installation of covering the bridge with knitted textiles as an homage to Cambridge's past to being a major textile producer. Over 1,000 knitters and a few crocheters contributed knitting projects that were zip tied to the bridge. After the installation, the knitting was cleaned and repurposed into scarves and blankets for those in need. Walking over the bridge, take a minute to admire the view of the river on either side. Watch for traffic and cross over to the Centennial Fountain and the start of the next walk. There's so much more to see in historic Galt Cambridge. Next week I'm going to be explaining why there's a cannon in Queen Square, tell you about the most famous murder mystery and scandal in Galt history that left a young woman's reputation in tatters, and why there's two spectacular churches built so close to each other. Join me.